Well, hello everyone. Uh, it's good to be back together again. It's been a few weeks and I'm glad we have this opportunity to join back together. We are here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. We have just finished a series in the Gospel of John. Uh, we were in that two years and it was a great series. Showed us simply a, a, the, a picture of Christ so clearly. Meeting our Savior face to face, meeting God face to face. John 20 gives us the purpose, showed us everything that was behind all that we unfolded in the, in the Gospel of John, that we are to see Jesus Christ as Savior, as the very Son of God. John calls us to faith in Him. He calls every, every man, woman, and child to faith in Christ, uh, to initiate faith in our heart by the work of the Holy Spirit, and then to, to sustain that faith in our walk day after day after day, moment after moment. And John emphasizes and highlights and shows us just the ministry of Christ, his example to us, his power available to us as we minister day by day. So we're moving from the Gospel of John now. We're going to do a, we're going to do a brief series. And uh, what I want to do is look at some things that are affecting us today. Understanding ministry opportunities today in the world that we face. And we're going to take, uh, we're going to take three weeks. Two of those are going to be online. One's going to be with our church. We're going to take some time. We're just going to look at We're going to set up a series that we're moving forward to here in October. And so the next three weeks, what I want to do is I'm just opening the door right now to where we're going to be going. Uh, today, we're going to look at some, some ministry paradigms that are just impacting and affecting everything that we do today. What does that mean for us? What kind of things uh, are, do we need to be aware of as we're looking ahead and living in the context of today? We're going to be talking about that today. What does that mean for Emmanuel? What does it mean for, for you and I uh, as believers? And then we're going to take a final look, putting all those things in the context of God's Word, God's prophetic Word. We're going to be looking ahead. We're going to be looking at God's timetable, His plan, end times. And I'm looking forward to that. We're going to set the table first these next few weeks. We're going to have inter interaction with our church and with you online. So I'm looking forward to, to that. Our goals are simple. Our goals are simple this, is just create an understanding of, of where we're at today. What is it that we're facing? Our culture is changing so much. Everything is changing around us so much. I don't have all the answers, but I just want to give you a sense of, of what I see and what the scripture is going to show us to evaluate what it means for the church. Not only for the church, but for you as, as the believer, you and I individually. What does it mean for us as individual believers? We have to uh, recognize what is God trying to do? What is he showing us? What do we need to be aware of so that we can be effective for the Lord in, in a culture that's changing so drastically and so much? And then to place it all into the context of God's word, his prophetic word. We're going to be looking at his plan, his timetable for humanity. We're going to be looking ahead. We're going to be looking down the road. We're going to be looking at our culture through the perspective and lens of, of God's view, his perspective, and what he's going to show us. So I'm looking forward to that. I think it'll be very beneficial to you, and so that's coming ahead. Today, as we start off, I want to look at uh, three paradigms that are affecting us today. Three, uh, three ways of just uh, of looking at the world around us. Basically, a paradigm is just this. It's just it's a standard. It's it's a perspective. It's it's a set of ideas. It's it's just a way that we look at things, and those and those are always changing standards we set for ourselves whether it's in science or whether it's in our life or worldview or in our culture, those, those paradigms, those standards, the way we view things, it's always changing. And because you, because you live life, you understand that, that everything around you is changing. Almost so fast sometimes it's hard to keep up with. And so I want to look at three of those things today that, uh, that have direct impact on our ministry right now and today and on your life right now and today. So let's do that here this morning. Father, we just pray that you would just uh, begin to show us what it is we need to see. We want to be effective for Christ. We want to have a, a ministry and an impact. We want to be uh, uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Christ in such a way that people are drawn to the testimony, the love and grace of Christ through our life. So we need to know our culture. We need to understand what's going on around us. So we pray that you would begin to, to show us some clarity, uh, refresh in our hearts the Word of God and its ability to, to walk with us and through uh, to help us walk through the things that we are seeing and experiencing in our lives. May you be honored and glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. The first paradigm I want to look at th is this. The first thing that's affecting our culture directly is COVID. You know that. 
Every day it's with us. It's all around us. Uh, it's affected us since March, and it's changed our country. It's changed your life. It's changed everything about us. Just share some things from the CDC. Just this week, uh, today, we were looking at some things. Our population in the, in the United States is just over 300 million people. It's a lot of people. 2% of those have been infected, according to the CDC website. 2%. In the last seven days, there's been 250,000 cases of the virus that have appeared in the United States. So that's, that's what they've diagnosed. There's been a total, since it started in March, a total of 6.3 million cases of COVID. 3% of those cases have resulted in death. That means there's been 190,000 deaths that have occurred. Those deaths have affected you, you know people, that are close to you in your life, that you love and treasure, maybe you know some individuals that have passed away, and I know you do. Uh, it's, it's had impact that way. And so we look at these statistics, we see the impact, uh, we understand what we're looking at and the seriousness of it. So COVID is a reality that we're facing. At the same time, COVID, COVID is, is, a, is an issue that is, that is uh, very volatile today, it seems like. Let's look at this. We understand that, that uh, COVID itself has become very uh, political. The information that, it, that is given is used for various purpose, purposes. Uh, stats sometimes are uh, used and manipulated and, and all kinds of things are happening. And, and uh, we're seeing this. Numbers are debated, they're argued. Uh, motives are being questioned. Standards are being applied uh, in, unequally. Uh, information is being uh, misused or hidden. All kind of things are happening. It's amazing the environment. It's amazing that something so serious, life and death, is taken on this persona of being political in every way. It shouldn't be that way at all. It should just simply be a concern about life and about death. People are reacting. Uh, there are people that, that are just feel the fear of going out, being around people. We were gone this last week. We are hiking. We encountered uh, an individual, we encountered a couple, we encountered different people. They would walk by all by themselves. No one, no one remotely around had masks on, outside wearing masks. It, it, it's affected us in, in those ways. Um, there's anger, anger at those who feel like maybe numbers are being um, misapplied, misused, um, used to an advantage to gain power, well, all that kind of stuff. There's so much emotion here. There's sadness over loss. There's all kind of things that we're feeling. People have lost lives. People have lost income. We know people right in our lives, right here in our church, that have lost their jobs because of this. People are hesitant in, in public. We see that. People are lonely. There are those who have not been able to get out, don't feel the safety to, to be out among the crowds, among the people, because of, because of their age, because of uh, uh, health needs. There's a loneliness that's real. Ministries have been impacted. Uh, churches have had to change ministries, have had to stop ministries. All different kind of Christian organizations have had to stop. Everything is being impacted in our culture that way. Relationships are being affected. There's so much that's going on. And so, you know, as just Emmanuel, as we're looking at our ministry, as we're looking at our own lives, as you're looking at your own lives, this is impacting things that you do one way or the other, and it will continue to impact for a foreseeable future. We don't know what a timetable is going to be for this to be to be eradicated, uh, where the threat is not like it was. We don't understand those things. We don't know. We don't have the answers. But it's here, it's real, and it's, it's, a, it's a part of our daily living. So we need to keep this in mind as we live life, as we do ministry. Another thing that, that I want to uh, share with you this morning is just simply changes in our culture. Uh, just in relation to how our culture views Christianity, how it views those who believe in Jesus Christ. I want to look at it through that lens this morning. We're going to take another look at it down the road. But right now, there's, there are those who just simply see uh, Christians, believers, as being naive, being uh, irrelevant to, to the solutions of society, not to be taken seriously. There are others who see Christianity, who see believers, see you and I as being uh, evil, as being dangerous. Even within Christianity, there is, there is a, there's a branch of Christianity that uh, that just lays out there that there are there are many ways to God. There's many ways to have a relationship with God. We we should when we engage people. We should never we should never lay that truth out and declare the truth of God when it comes to having a relationship with God. 
biblical absolutes or standards of the Word of God, even Christi even some within Christianity teach this, uh, are counterproductive uh, to lay the standards of God's Word before someone with love. To lay absolutes of God's Word before someone is, is not loving. Uh, the essential among many Christians is, is our climate, it's the earth, it's, it's relationship to the earth, it's uh, social justice, it's inequality, it's racism, it's inclusiveness, it's all these things, which some of these things are significantly important. But, but what, what happens is, is, there, is there, there is a thread of Christianity that's taking the focus away from the gospel, away from the word of God, away from the life-changing truth of the word of God. And uh, it's having real impact. And then our culture, just how it looks and how it views uh, the world around it and us. Feelings, feelings are more important than facts. Why well, don't we see this every day? What I feel, what I feel, my experience, my feelings, it trumps truth. We are seeing that every day, all the time on the news and social media. We're seeing this reality being played out. And it's impacting us. And it impacts your witness and your ability to engage the culture around you and the people around you. Love is defined now today as simply accepting and affirming others. It's not about it's not about uh, um, revealing someone's status before God, their need before God. Uh, that is that is a frowned upon as a negative in our life, in the testimony of a believer. Love is not moving someone towards the Word of God, towards the truth of God's Word. And so this affects Christians, and this affects how the culture views our message, views our testimony, views the church today. Not only that, but we see this, that uh, tolerance. Tolerance is turned into intolerance. There is a rigidness now between people. Diversity. Diversity in reality doesn't allow for the diversity of thought, doesn't allow for diverse points of view. Uh, diversity breaks down in its concept because it doesn't really allow for the balance of worldviews and of thoughts to be brought in, to the table and put on the table. Truth is hidden. Truth is uncomfortable. Truth is evil. These are the things that we're facing today as believers. Uh, those that are that are understood or deemed to be dangerous, they're canceled. We see a cancel culture out there that's very strong. Maybe you've been affected by that. Maybe you're afraid you'll be affected by that. Maybe you're afraid of what you've said, what's in the past, that it just can eradicate and, and overwhelm your life. It's a real fear that probably all of us have, and uh, it's very strong in our culture. Uh, censorship is now accepted. The hiding of truth is accepted. Balance. Balance in our life is, is lost. Now it seems that it's, it's so common that, that, that we simply take in news, we take in information only from sources that we agree with. Medical information, news information, worldview information, whatever that is, instead of reading and being aware of other points of view, of respecting other points of view, of, of others who hold different points of view, we're losing these things. We've lost these things. It's important. Uh, you know, it's another element here that's true. Efforts to find common ground with someone is, is not only frowned upon, it's dangerous. Um, if I, don't, if I, if I uh, interact with someone who, who doesn't agree with me, uh, if they don't affirm my position, then you are, you are viewed as dangerous to me. And that is not encouraged at all to cross, to cross that divide and, and to engage someone who, who disagrees and has a, has a completely different worldview, try to find that common ground. Christianity is unique. It is uniquely evil. We're seeing that because uh, because of its uh, intolerance. Its intolerance, its non-negotiable uh, standards, biblical standards. We bring the Word of God into our life. We bring it into our testimony. And uh, there is a special wrath for Christians and for the Word of God. And it's being put on display more and more all the time. It's, it's intimidating to all of us, it's unnerving to all of us, and it's an opportunity to every one of us. And we need to, we need to with the wisdom of God's Word, now how do we engage um, this culture? And how do we, how do, we do that? Um, if you and I hold a biblical standard, we may lose our job, we may lose our prestige, we may lose our influence, our power, our res the respect of those around us. This is the culture that we're living in. Atheism simply used to mean I don't believe in God. Even, even, even the, the, that element of non-Christianity has changed. 
It's now more of an anti-Christian mo movement. Atheism here, it assumes that Christianity isn't just naive and false. It's taken it another step, and, and Christianity is now viewed as the cause of the social chaos and the ills that are going on all around us. And so it's worth it to take any steps possible to eradicate, to ferret out, to, to, to remove the impact of Christianity. And so there's a strong, there's a strong movement in our country to undermine, to remove from the public arena the impact, the thought, uh, the input of Christians and believers and of the Word of God. We're seeing that in media, we're seeing that in the news, we're seeing that in, in, in uh, local communities and decisions, decision-making boards, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, you know, just to summarize, our world is experiencing chaos, upheaval, uncertainty, tension. You know that. I know that. We feel that. We see that. There's a fear that it's going to get worse, right? Uh, our relationships are strained with people. We see that as we just watch people interact with one another. People groups are divided now. There's no sense of harmony between people groups. There's, there's the casting of accusations against people groups. Communication is, is thwarted. It is shut down. It's not encouraged. There is hatred, there is anger, there is uh, frustration. Um, all this runs really deep. Unity, reunity just is impossible when these are the mindsets that we bring to the table. And so that's what we're looking at. That's what we're, that's what we're understanding. And, um, and worldviews are just outright being rejected. So when we look at our culture, we look at the, the reality of COVID and how it has, how it has uh, separated us, when we look at the reality of our culture and the changes that are happening even just this year, even the last few months, so much has happened and so much is taking place currently. We have an election coming up. It's volatile. Um, there's a lot in our culture that's going on. God's in control. God knows what's going on. God uses every, God uses every circumstance as opportunity uh, to give the believer grace for the moment to give the believer wisdom for the moment, to give the believer love in the moment. God is right there on the throne. He's in charge, and he's aware of all these things. He is sovereignly allowing these things to take place because he has a plan. We're going to be talking about that plan as we look ahead. I'm, I'm excited about that. And I want to encourage you that, that there is an answer from God's word. There is an answer from God to your heart and into your life. We're going to be looking at that. So the believer, what do we do? How do we engage this world? What are we to do? Well, I want us to, I want us to remember something really important. We have a call that's been placed upon our life. Oops, here we go. It's from, it's from Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It's the call. It's the Great Commission. It's the call to go. We're called to evangelize. We're called to disciple. You know that word there, go, is a participle. It's I-N-G. As you are going, it's assumed that every believer, every child of God is actively involved in evangelism. And as we're going, then we are to make disciples. We are to make disciples. We're to go and share the gospel, and then disciples are being made. They're receiving Christ, becoming disciples in that moment. And then we're to show them the path of Christ, observing, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded to you. That is, that is standards, God's standards for our life. That is God's absolutes for our life. We're to be engaged in that. We're to lovingly be engaged in that. Okay? So, so what, is, oops, what is our relationship to the world? As we think about the Great Commission, we think about going, we think about evangelism, we think about discipleship, we just think about making an impact for Christ. We have to, we have to keep in mind our relationship to what we just saw. You know, when we just scratched the surface, barely just put on the table, just a small sample of so many things that are happening right now and that you're aware of and that I'm aware of. How do we engage this, and how do we view this, and how do we understand ourselves? First Peter chapter two verse eleven, and second, First Chronicles chapter twenty-nine verse fifteen. Peter tells us we he reminds us we're exiles. Okay, beloved, I urge you. I urge you. He's writing. He's writing to the church. I urge you as sojourners and as exiles. He says that is what you are. You need to understand that it hasn't changed. In First Chronicles. We see as, as the temple is built and David is worshiping, uh, the opportunity to build a temple, David is worshiping and he says in an offering before God, he says, we're strangers before you, God, and we are sojourners just like our fathers were on this earth. 
uh, we're a shadow and we don't abide here. This isn't our home. This is this isn't our dwelling place for all eternity. We are sojourners and we are exilers. We don't, we don't, this isn't our home. In fact, Peter reminds us that we're chosen for this. We're chosen to be aliens. We're chosen to be set apart to those who are elect exiles, chosen as exiles, according to God's knowledge, his foreknowledge. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Those of you who are traveling, you're distinct from everyone else, you believers, you followers of Jesus Christ. You're so different than everyone else. You are exiles, you are aliens, you are sojourners. Grace and peace to you to enable you to be what God called you to be in that relationship with your world and with people in your life, with family members in your life, with co-workers in your life, with neighbors in your life. How do we do that? It's important to understand these things. We don't belong, 1 Peter 4.4. 4. They, the world, the world's always astonished when we, don't run, when we don't think the way they do, when we don't do the things they do, when, we, when we, our lives are changed. They can't understand that. In fact, they hate that. It says at the end of this verse, and they will vilify you, they will hate you, they will mock you, they will come after you when your life is revealed to be about Christ, when your identity is Christ. So he reminds us in chapter 4, verse 12, we're not to be surprised. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised when trials, when testing, when adversity, when hardship comes into your life. I want to encourage you, this is part of God's plan for your life and for mine. Hebrews 13, 13 reminds us that we are, we are to accept the identity of Christ. That's what we do when we receive Jesus Christ as believers. We're to accept the cost of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that is endured. That's a picture of the Old Testament. Sin was, those who sin were driven outside the camp. The unclean was driven outside the camp. Jesus took our sin. He was crucified outside the city. We are to be like Christ, to go outside of the culture, to be identified as those who are different from the culture, to identify with Christ. That's what we're called to do. Unless we, unless we fully embrace who Jesus Christ is, as we saw from the Gospel of John and how we're going to see as we look ahead, we'll never, we'll never embrace this mission here. We will come to the conclusion it's simply not worth it. But when we, when we gain a clear view of our Savior, a clear view of who He is and what He's done for us and why He did that for us and what He's called us to and what He's promised for us to give us and how He's promised to use us, it changes, it changes everything and it's worth it all. We're to follow Christ, 1 Peter 2, 21. For this you have been called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you and I and we and all of us together, we might follow in his steps. That's what he's called us to do in this culture today. 1 Peter 2, 23. So we are to commit our responses to him. Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. In other words, he didn't react. He didn't give in kind. He didn't spew out hatred to those who hated him. He didn't spew out an anger to those who were angry at him. But he instead, he committed himself, he entrusted himself to his father as we entrust ourselves to him and to our father, to him who judges justly. He committed himself to the one who's in control. He responded biblically. He left the results in God's hands. He loved not only the disciples, but he loved this world to the very end. For God so loved the world, he went to the cross. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to go to that cross. Jesus, because of love, went to that cross. And that leads us to this, to this third paradigm. The first one is today is just simply looking at the reality of COVID. It's impacting us. The reality of our culture in relation to how they view Christianity us as believers and then the, and those are always changing it's changing it'll change for the worse COVID we don't know how it's going to change but they're always changing this third paradigm is a, is a paradigm that doesn't change it is the paradigm of of uh well let's go here first okay first Peter 120 121 we're to be filled with hope be filled with hope we are believers in God. If you know Jesus Christ, you have put faith in him. God raised him from the dead. He gave him glory so that your faith, my faith, and hope would be in him. And that's what will hold us true and steady as we move forward. 
So this third paradigm is, is the Scripture. It's the Word of God. It is timeless. It doesn't change. It is the standard for our life. It is, its principles are, are unchanging. They are, they are applicable and real and true and powerful in every generation in your life, in the generation to come, of your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and those who have gone before us. The Word of God has been, has been true in every generation and powerful. It meets the needs of our culture in every generation and it meets the needs of every believer. The Word of God reminds us of our mission. What is our mission? We have, to, we have to understand this as we step in to engage our culture. Our mission, again, is Matthew 18. It's our call. Our call, our call is evangelism. Our call is discipleship. He's called us all to be a witness for Jesus Christ in a very dark culture, in a very dark world. We are to be lights. We're to, we're to shine the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And we're to, we're to be committed to making disciples, helping others to invest in the lives of brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ to help us in strength to grow and to move forward in obedience to Jesus Christ and in passion and love for Jesus Christ. But there's a mission that underlines that. Why? Why might I be committed to, these, to this call in my life? Why is the believer to be committed to this? What is it that motivates our heart, that drives your heart and my heart to take this, this immense sacrificial step of following after Jesus Christ to make disciples, to reach people for Jesus Christ? Well, that becomes, I think, ultimately our mission. This evangelism and discipleship are built on a foundation that drives these two. That foundation is what I want to talk about in the remainder of our time here. That mission is this, it's to love God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind. With everything that we have and everything that we are, we are to love God. We are to be in love with Him. We go and evangelize. We make disciples because we are smitten by God's love. We're committed to loving others because Jesus Christ loved us. So we lovingly care for others and we reach into their lives because the Lord loved us. It is about loving Him first. I need to, I need to before anything, any step of obedience, before anything else I do, I need to be cultivating my own heart, my, my relationship to the Lord myself. I need to love Him from the, from the depths of my heart. I need to understand He is... The, he is he is all that I have. He is the best that I have. He is the greatest thing that I possess in this life. And I need to fall in love with Him every morning and every day. Because our mission is not only to love Him, our mission is to love others. We're to love our neighbors, ourselves. That's, that's those who are potentially unsaved and unbelievers. And we're, to, and we're to love one another. That's the believer. And so we're to love anyone that comes across our path. And this won't happen unless I first am in love with Jesus Christ. Okay? That is important. We are to be defined by His love. We're to be defined by the love of Jesus Christ. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. This is to be the defining mark of the believer. You know, believers in the church are to be driven by evangelism and driven by a passion for discipleship. But what drives those both is first being driven by love, being motivated by a love for God, understanding the love of God into our life, and understanding how to, how to apply that love through our lives to everyone that we meet. It is the love of God that is, that is the oil that makes everything work. It is, it is that which drives us. I want to, I want to give you a, mi a ministry grid that we've used here at, at the church and uh, if you're a member of Emmanuel, a friend of Emmanuel, you know this already, you've seen this, but I want us to show us a different way of looking at it. It is, it is this, uh, what, O-H-I-O. -O. You know I'm a uh, Michigan fan, you understand that, boo, go ahead, boo. This is, a great, this is a great acronym to help us understand, though, the Word of God, the, the principles of the Word of God for life and for ministry. And I want to put this into the context of our need to love the Lord, of our need to, to model the love of Jesus Christ. If we're going to engage our culture, we're going to do it powerfully. If we're going to do it with grace, if we're going to do it and make an imp impact, we must love difficult people. We must love God first. 
we must receive his love into our life so that it changes me. So let's look at that. There are four elements, O, H, I, O, okay? You understand those. The first emphasis on, on O is that of being uh, of outward. An, outward, an outward focus in ministry of going, of, of evangelizing, of reaching people for Jesus Christ. Every church, every believer needs to be focused and committed on reaching out with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus Christ. Because I love the Lord, because I love him, because it's changing my life, then I will share the gospel. I share the life-changing love of Jesus Christ. Because I love the Lord, because I love him, I'm going to share his love with others. If I truly love him, then it's going to come out of my life. The gospel, good news in a culture that doesn't understand what good news is all about. In a world that needs desperately good news, God has called me to be the agent of that, an ambassador for him, to share the news of Jesus Christ. I will do that boldly, and I will do that with grace, only if I love Jesus Christ. If I love Jesus Christ, I will care about the souls of other people. I will look at those in my family, and I will look at those in my life through the lens of eternity. And I will look at them with a love that cares for their soul. And no matter the cost, no matter the time frame that it takes, no matter the patience that must be exhibited, no matter the wisdom of God that needs to be implied upon my life, I will love them with truth and with the gospel, and I will share the good news of Jesus Christ. I will share how it's impacting my life and how it can change their life forever. I will share Jesus Christ, his message of forgiveness, because I love the Lord. If I love the Lord, then I know without a doubt that what he's done in my life, it must be shared with the people around me. I, I will be burdened for people who need the Lord, and you will be burdened for people who need the Lord. If you love Jesus Christ, you will look at people, and you will see them as people who need the Lord. And in love, you will yield to God's strength and wisdom to have the boldness to make a difference for him. It is His love that makes a difference. That is our mission. That's what drives our mission in evangelism. The next one is H. O H. That's a heavenward focus. That is a that is a that is a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It is it is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is cultivating that that essential I need you relationship with God. It is every day waking up and saying, Lord, I need you today. I need you today. I need you today. And so because that's true, because I love him, when I worship, this is what I'm saying. Lord, I will conform. I will conform to the life-changing love of Jesus Christ. His love is my standard. His love is what I conform to. When I read the scriptures, when I consider Christ and the gospel of John and throughout the word of God, I simply see his love. And he calls me to conform to that love, to mold my, my life around the attributes of his love, around the qualities of his love. To, to set that as the standard for my life and for my heart. That's what he calls me to do. And so when I worship, I exalt him because I love him. When I worship him, I conform to his image. Uh, I conform to his power. I conform to his priorities in my life. I conform to his plan for my life because I love him. When I worship, I am yielding to him. When I worship, I am submitting to him. When I worship, I am, I am saying, Lord, conform me to your image. That's what I'm saying. And so love motivates that. Love drives that. If you love Jesus Christ, that is the passion of your heart to be more like the Lord, to be like Christ. The third, the third element of OH is the I, O-H-I. That, that was an inward focus. That is, that is a ministry directed into the body of Jesus Christ for the sake of the glory of God, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of discipleship. It's all of these things. And when it's motivated by love, that what happens is I serve. I serve motivated by the life-changing love of Jesus Christ. See, that love changes me. I can't serve with this kind of motive. I can't serve with this kind of passion until the love of Jesus Christ is changing me. And one of the things that's, one of the things that's been a challenge in this COVID is some of us have lost the sense of the need to serve His church, to serve one another, to stay active somehow and in some way in serving others in taking the gospel out and continuing to worship and to grow. That is the key 
His love is, is life-changing. It continues to grab a hold of my life no matter the circumstances of my life. If I can't get out, if I can get out, if I go to church, if I'm not able to go to church, His love is what drives it. His love instills within the heart of every believer a desire to invest in believers for the sake of Christ, to help the church to grow and to be strong, to stand together as a, as a, as a unified witness for Jesus Christ. And then that's what I do. I put the needs of others first. I take the graces of God that he's poured into my life. I take those graces into my life and I use those graces for his glory. And I use those graces for the benefit of the body of Jesus Christ because I love him. The fourth element is O-H-I-O. It's this last O. It's, it is, it is, a, it is a, a commitment to continue in my life the work that Jesus Christ began when I was saved. It is onward. It is an onward focus. It is, it is love drives me to be conformed. I'm conformed by, by I'm characterized. I'm characterized by the, un, the life-changing love of Jesus Christ. I'm conformed to his love when I worship. When I yield to him, the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, he works in my heart, and he begins to conform me to his image. As I put that into practice every day, as I just make good decisions, and I make decisions that reflect the principles of God's Word, my life begins to show and reveal the conformity that's taking place to the Word of God. And my life begin, is now characterized by qualities of the Word, the qualities of Jesus Christ that are pouring out of my life. And so when, when I am committed to this, I'm committed to growth. I'm committed to change. The love of Jesus Christ is defining my life. It is changing my life. It is changing me. That's what it's doing. Love drives all of this. It is a love relationship. I love the Lord, and I'm, I am committed to these things, and I'm convinced that these are the very best things for my life and for my witness for Jesus Christ. I don't perfectly do these things every day. I need the Lord's help every day. But this is my commitment. This is my drive. And this is my desire. And I, and I call you and all of us to stand together in Jesus Christ that we might embrace this. That we would love Jesus Christ so much that these elements would then pour into our life, out of our life, and Jesus Christ would be seen. Our greatest legacy. Our greatest legacy. Your greatest legacy. My greatest legacy is, is to embrace this. It's that Jesus Christ would be our first love. In Revelation we see that. He calls the church out because it says, you're doing all these things which are good, but you have lost your first love. I think for many believers, the most necessary step that we need to rekindle in our life is to regain that first love. We need to rekindle that. It's transformative. We need to renew that love. We need to serve in the power of that love. We need to walk in that love. We need to share that love. We need to model that love. We need to be defined by that love, but first we just simply need to yield to it. Our first love. You know, our time commitments show what we love. What we think about shows what we love. And for many of us, for many, it's just simply our time is, is we pour out. We pour out time. Time that we waste on ourselves and time that we waste on things that we would rather do than be devoted to Jesus Christ and follow after him. We have a culture that needs the church. We have, a, we have a culture that needs the gospel. We have a culture that needs to see what genuine love is all about. I can't show that with my life until it's in my life. I can't have that as my motive for others if that's not the motive from God into my own life. I want you to consider this. Our secular world is increasingly suspicious of religion. And I want to, I want to just read this. It's from the book... Evangelism and Exiles by Elliot Clark. And I just want to read a short little paragraph. Our secular world is increasingly suspicious of religion. Christians are no longer part of the solution. We are the problem. Pastors aren't trustworthy. Churches are suspect. Bible believers are bigots. Thus the days of attractional evangelism are waning. The times of relying on the gravitational pull of our social standing to bring people into church, into a Christian camp, or revival meeting are all but gone. People aren't naturally drawn to the church anymore. They don't see it with respect. They don't see it as, as an agent for good in the community and in the culture. It's changing very much. 
The time is coming, and it here it is here now when the church, when the world won't listen to our gospel simply because they respect us. They don't respect us. They won't listen to us because they don't respect who we are. They don't respect our standard. They don't respect who our identity is in. They don't, they don't respect that. So what are we to do? How are we to handle this? The world hates us and our message. They see us as, as troublesome at best, dangerous at worst. He goes on to say in this chapter, however they might listen, if we respect them, if we love them. He spends time cultivating the need for us to see our cultures through the lens of God's love, to, to honor and to respect authorities, to honor and respect and love our enemies, to give dignity to others who don't deserve it, to show grace to those who don't deserve it, to embrace into our lives those who are different than us, to let, the, to let the love and grace of God come into our life and let the relationship that we have with Christ be revealed in showing the love of Jesus Christ. That's our call. That's a challenge for us today. We're going to take time and we're going to look at this. What does that mean for us? What does it mean for our church, specifically our local church? If you can join us next week, we're going to take time. We're going to take a practical look at this, what it means for us. I want, you, I want to encourage you to be thinking about that. We, we'll meet back, back together online in two weeks, and then we'll, and we'll come back together. We're going to move towards a series. We're going to put all this into context. We're going to put it into the context of God's Word. We're going to start a new series. We're going to bring the Word of God to bear. We're going to, we're going to take a, a clear glimpse into God's plan for humanity, what it is that he's planning, what's his timetable, what does prophecy say, what is God going to do, and what does he want to do now in our life as he's moving us towards really a prophetic end, towards a timetable that is that it will be fulfilled in the Word of God. In the meantime, let us serve Christ well, love him well. Today's challenge, cultivate your love for the Lord. Take time to do that. Lay your heart before the Lord and say, Lord, if there's anything that stands between me and you, God, remove that with your grace and your love. Forgive that, I confess it. And God, just pour, pour your love into my life. Change my will so that I am, I am driven to love you, to depend on you, to say, God, I need you, God, I want you, and God, I want to exalt and honor you in my life to those around me who so desperately need that love and grace as well. May the Lord do that in our life, we pray. We invite you to come back in two weeks, and we'll join with you then. Lord, use this uh, reminder, this just beginning focus, to bring to our heart just the necessity, the privilege of your love into our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.